All right, so welcome. So we have a really special guest here. We have one of the artists from um, Tops uh, Spotlight 70 is what it's called, Spotlight correct? Spotlight 70, correct. Very cool. So um, we are so happy to have you. And actually, I saw that there's part two. So is it is this actually a two-part series? Starting today, it is. That Spotlight is... 70 was announced yesterday. Spotlight 72 was announced yesterday and available today at Tops.com. Awesome. Very cool. So Spotlight 70 came out, okay. available in boxes, 10 yeah. pack last so, summer. So this is them. So this and is really the, cool. The new one dropped today. And it drops today. Yeah. Are they available to buy yet today or no? Yep. Awesome. Tops. Okay. Com. Very cool. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I'd love to just go into kind of your origin story. I know that you and I talked a little bit before we got started, but I just love to hear how you got in the hobby, how you became an artist, just your origin story. Hmm. Well, I didn't become an artist. I think I was encouraged from the start to believe I always was, and it's okay. just what I was. Sure. And I guess I had a knack for drawing things the way they're the way they look in their physical form and so as early as kindergarten i remember kind of drawing a crowd you know okay. teachers and students alike so it felt like some kind of superpower sure in a certain way and it quickly became an identity and a source of self-esteem yeah and with that you learn techniques i started studying seriously in at the age of 16, I started going half-day programs in high school to draw from the model. And by 17, I was taking a graduate anatomy class, learning the secrets of the old masters and drawing from skinned cadavers at Columbia University. Gotcha. And I devoted myself to the old masters uh, when I was younger. Wasn't even in college. Sure. I was painting paintings of uh, guys I played softball with in summer as as in like a 1980 tops border. So all <laughs> That's through so my cool. life, the iconography of baseball cards was yeah. like a landscape. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. Do you have like uh, a certain set that you tend to be drawn to? Like for me personally, 1987 tops, like I love it. I mean, that's classic to me. Them. But what about for you? Is there something that's there? I mean, that's right in my wheelhouse. I started collecting in 86. Okay, got it. So the first- With the black borders and the, the black and white? You know, I actually started collecting in 85 with Garbage Pail Kids and oh, wrestling nice. cards. Oh, yeah. And I wasn't much of a baseball fan. Sure. I grew up on Long Island, the New York Mets, 1986. I was yep. 11 years old. Of course, I got Met fever. Plus, yeah. my grandpa was a Dodgers fan turned Met fan when they left to LA. So Mets, heritage, baseball, going to the store already to buy Garbage Pail Kids, baseball cards, not really into baseball. Could be fun to get all the Mets. Sure. And I got hooked. Yeah. So by 87, it was so exciting because it was like we were there from the beginning. The anticipation of wondering yeah. what the design was going to look like. Yeah. Then in 87, I started going to card shows. The first card I ever purchased, I painted for the Spotlight 72 set, which is also a blow up there at my booth, 1972 Tops Roberto Clemente. Oh, sweet. Okay. So I immediately went backwards. The vintage cards, you know? Yeah. Uh, is that the one that you have right here or no? Is that the 72? is the 72. Okay. Also a teammate of Roberto Clemente. This is an original painting used to create that card for the Tops Spotlight 70 set. Wow. I thought I'd bring that to yeah. show you. This all is of so those cool. originals are five inches by seven, this size. Okay. In the Spotlight 70 set, all the originals are painted this size. Okay, got so it. So it's, it's kind of yeah. it's, it's kind of cool to see them. They're so, yeah. reduced as Spotlight yeah. 70, but. So that's the original art. So original so art. everyone is originally done like this, and then it gets Turned reduced into down. into a card. Yeah. In the Spotlight 70 set, they were reduced. In this one, they're not reduced. Got it, okay. But the original paintings are one of ones. Yeah, for sure. As a painter, I've been dealing in one of ones for a, a yeah. long time. To converge these two worlds and interests, it, it, it like literally meets in this project, and it can't. It could be more of a thrill to me. Now, do you ever do you sell your originals or do you keep all these? You do They're, sell the originals. The originals are collected. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah very and, cool. And, and that's 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 a beautiful reality, and it's important to me because my paintings are my kids. They need to get a job, <laughs> that get makes out sense. of the house, you know? So it's proud, I, I'm proud every time I see, see one of them go. Yeah. Uh, ever since Spotlight 70 was rendered first series this morning, uh, uh, a bunch of these have, have started, to, started to go. So Got it. Um, that makes me feel good. Yeah. 
So you, so you get into the hobby as a kid, um, you become obviously this incredible artist, uh, at a young age as well. And you said you started to paint, you know, some cards and stuff like that. What is the rest of your life leading up to today? Have you always done painting on hobby cards or did you kind of make a transition and change? Uh, I may, I've made a living for the last 20, I used, I, I pushed around the mail cart at the New Yorker magazine okay. when I was young out of college. That ended up, I, I started illustrating for them. I, I've been drawing celebrities for magazines and newspapers for 20 years Got with it. a very different line. Actually, a more, there are a couple of cards in the Spotlight 72 set where I used the style that I would draw in the magazines. I did that for 20 years. I, I drew so much, I blew my hand out. Gotcha. I had to reinvent a new style based on the limitation of, you know, carpal tunnel which is how I came up with this, started drawing my favorite baseball cards to find a comfortable place to explore this new uh, weakness, you know, and strength. But I've been an artist the whole time. While I illustrated, that's been, that's what supported, you know, everything. I, I toured as a musician for 10 years. Okay. So I was doing a lot of my illustrations from hotel rooms. Sure. The morning after a night, where I would play until three in the morning and then have a seven hour drive. Yeah. So for a 10 year period there, you know, it was all a, a blur of all of my artistic interests converging at once. Gotcha. But drawing baseball cards is literally what I would be doing anyway at my core. Makes so sense. For that to then become... Uh, something that also becomes something like a job, although it's not a job, is yeah. really just the ultimate for me as a, a painter. For all I've done in art, this is like, for me, the, the pinnacle. So how do we make the step over from illustrator for the New Yorker to now famous artist for Topps baseball cards? How do we make that? How do they get in touch with you? Well, I mentioned I got carpal tunnel. I did a, an illustrated essay for the New Yorker's website about how I started recovering from that injury by bravely drawing without a pencil or uh, rulers or anything I used to be accustomed as a former perfectionist. Sure. When I lost my ability to be what I used to perceive as perfect, I had to reinvent. Yeah. I chose a safe subject matter, which brought me back to a certain youthful calm. I did this essay for the New Yorker and it was illustrated with 15 illustrations. So it's like a Rick Peters, 1981 tops, Detroit Tigers, Champ Summers, 1979 tops, Pete Vukovic, 1980 Cardinals. You know, the idea of putting out a set of those players was an original discussion but the rights to those players weren't on the table gotcha. so that's sort of how it was born really through it's been a passion project all along how i got in touch with tops or how they got in touch with me is just you know in the stars yeah you know yeah that makes sense so so we're obviously out here this is friday the first night of mint collective just what have you seen or enjoyed so far with the show honestly i forgot i was on a podcast these discussions <laughs> yeah is what i've enjoyed so far you automatically have something in common with everybody one person was like i'm sorry i'm not really on social media i'm a little socially awkward i i'm sorry You're like what do you pod i I collect big cards. Like it's okay, man. <laughs> yeah. We're all we all uh, we all understand what what our brains are like. The joy that this hobby, which I like to elevate to uh, the, the 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 idea that it's an institution. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. If it was a hobby, we wouldn't have to pay taxes on the earnings. True. Yeah. You know. So really, it's time. It's it's an institution, and that is a compliment to the uh, you know hobby descriptor. But anyhow, uh, the conversations, the community is, it, it's like hanging out in front of the pharmacy buying cards in 1987 with yeah, your friends. That's super cool. That is really good. Yeah, it's, it's such a unique, this event, I think. So I travel the country and go to these shows, and this is one of the most unique 
events that I've been to because it's so clean, so well done, um, so many amazing names. So I think they did a great job here. Yeah, and, and I, I, I agree. It is the first of its kind, and I do see it really thriving and developing along the way for an industry that's you know, do, doing, doing that right along with it. I mean, it, we, we need a, a, a community a place to uh, ideas are exchanged in sure. your office place yeah at the water cooler yeah for sure so art cards in general have become really big obviously your hand painted art there was the tops project 70 the, the regular project 70 that came out there's a project 2020 and there's many other people here that do custom cut pieces mm -hmm. or painted or things like do you see that as just continuing to grow? Because I think it's so it's so cool to see. But yes, I do. Yeah, I do. Uh, I I like how the whole uh, licensing scare shook out. I like what's happening right now in mm -hmm. the world of cards and all the exciting things that all these exciting companies are doing. Um, uh, what was the question? I just blanked out. Uh, no, no. Just do you see the oh. art world continuing to embrace this? Y yes. And yeah. so the scare was a scare, like how it all ended up. But it did put my in my mind, like, what if cards didn't need licensing? Sure. Yeah. And I mean, we console ourselves with an album piece of cardboard in our hands where we're looking at the cover we're listening to the music the content we're collecting these products there's a lot of possibilities a lot of potential i feel like through trading cards i'd like to make emotional connections sure where maybe someone who just broke up with someone is like i gotta get that new set gotcha you know like yeah. frank sinatra sang me through hard times with songs for only the lonely what if there's a set yeah, where, you know, so, that could so, really drive you, make an impact on you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and great. You want to see the original art? It's hanging in a gallery. Yeah. You want to collect the original art? Great, it's yours. You can have it, the ultimate one of one. But that's not what it's about. Yeah, Very this is cool. about like, come on, set them up, Joe. You know, or whatever someone has to say. So the possibilities are are endless and yeah i'm with you on that now i don't know if you're involved in this at all but have you done anything with the crossover the nft world to the art world or even your own pieces or no yeah i've begun to research okay. and ask questions i'm totally into the idea of the nft i i'm totally excited by the idea that a digital file can be considered uh an original work an yeah. original that's cool conceptually in the conversation of our ever expanding, you know, ability to understand and perceive art and big ideas, that's an advancement. What is created in that sphere beyond just proof that it exists remains to be seen. Like artists will elevate that form. I, I, I like how an artist is given a cut every time it changes hands. Yes. That's huge for artists. Yeah. I mean, you know, you could be a musician and have a one hit wonder and the rest of your life, your family has nine yachts. Yeah. So why shouldn't an artist profit from mass popularity if that should happen? If, it, if, if they create a piece of work that they sell for nothing and it ends up commanding bazillions, why should the artist get a little kickback? And for that, sure that's yeah. awesome and that allows artists to continue to work so it's all that's all cool where, where as an ink and watercolor artist i do get a lot of people look they don't teach the kind of drawing i studied for the most part in art school anymore they don't really require figure drawing and all the traditional stuff people say to me all the time why do you use ink and watercolor there are apps that will you know duplicate any stroke you could make and they're correct there are I've mm -hmm. seen covers on the Time magazine that you think is an oil painting. It's not. It's done on an iPad. Gotcha. You can't delete. Yeah. You can't delete ink and watercolor. Right. I have a tremendous amount of respect for the digital art medium. And like I'm saying, groundbreakers will come along. They already have and continue to advance that. But as an artist who plays solely on that risk factor, you know, this is my sphere. 
where you can take this ink and watercolor work and turn them into NFTs and play with that and all that is, is really exciting to me. Yeah. But I like the tactile. Plus, NFTs are awesome. I love the concept. Um, I heard a collector of NFTs say something about how physicality is rendered obsolete in the NFT. And I, I'll just disagree with the value of finding obsolescence in physicality. Sure. If that was the case, then how much are you going to pay for the $7 million Mickey Mantle if I put it in the laundry? Correct, yes. And to remove that factor from collectability is interesting to me. Yeah. Since we clamor over grading and every people are looking at corners with microscopes that are you could, like the Hubble telescope. Yeah. Physicality doesn't matter. Yeah. So I'm not saying that it that an argument can't be made where it doesn't matter, but that's going to be interesting for me to see how that plays yeah, out. Yeah, really, really interesting insight there of what you're talking about. So grading obviously became a huge thing, right, over the course of, especially 2020, but all the companies. So any thoughts on grading? Worth it, not worth it? Like, do you, does it mean anything to you? Yeah, it, 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 it solves the problem of overproduction. Sure. And we like rarity. We like scarcity. We've It's been made clear that people will spend a lot of money on having the card that they want. And if the card that they want is one that is meets their expectation or definition of what perfection is, then they're entitled to know that it is officially that. Yeah. If they're going to spend that kind of money on it. And to have a standard in the industry that says it's okay, this is perfect. This is it. According to our understanding of what perfection is, is a, a fair. Sure. I get that. That's cool. I like it. Yeah. But do I have graded cards? Yeah. Mostly I like find, I might collect Gem Mint 10, like, like it's totally random. Because that's what you enjoy. Yeah, like I have and a that's 1988 awesome. score, Eric Davis, Tim Raines, Speed and Power. Sure. You know, yeah. a Gem Mint 10. I have yeah. a Gem Mint 10, 86, tops traded, uh, Tom Seaver. Okay. The Red Sox yeah. airbrushed, which, yeah. by the way, is painted for the Spotlight 72 set. Very cool. But So I collect cards like that in a Gem Mint 10. Yeah. But yeah. I like the grading, yeah. Yeah. So just a couple more questions that I have for you. So the next two to five years in the market, what do you see happening in the hobby market? Or, uh, as you said, not uh, the industry market, but, yeah, in general. Po possibilities being met, realized, achieved, and furthered. Gotcha. That's good. What do you see? So for yourself, is there any piece that you've done that you love so much that you would be unwilling to get rid of? Do you have that like your grail piece for you? Yes. What is it? One of my two trading cards, Little League issued cards from my 1986 Little League team, which okay. I autographed when I was a kid and stuck a, a Topps Rookie Cup onto. That's awesome. I would be willing to sell that one, but for some reason, I'm not willing to part with the one that I didn't touch. Really? Yeah. Okay. You that, would sell the modified one, yeah. but not your yeah, original. Yeah, because that's a work of art. Yeah. And as an artist, my art, if it's still living at home, is like a kid that should have gotten a job by now. Sure. Yeah. So any art that I create, I like to see in the hands of a collector. It makes me happy. That is an early probably one of, one of my earliest art cards of my career. Actually, very shortly after that, when I was 12, I, was, I struck out every at-bat my first year of Little League. Okay. I made a, my own rookie card to like inspire me to keep continuing because Mike Schmidt struck out a lot when he was a rookie, yeah. and then he led the league in home runs. Yeah. I found that art, scanned it. It's a short-run print in the new Spotlight 70 set. So a card I actually drew when I was 12 to How motivate cool is myself that? Has, is now being released by Tops, which is pretty awesome full circle. That's, uh, that is really that's cool. That's my gem possession, yeah. Yeah. So last thing, how do people find you? Where do they follow you? Social media, that kind of stuff. Uh, well, my website is andyfriedman.net and I'm Sunday Friedman at Instagram. 
You can go to tops.com. Tops.com. Spotlight 72 is available today. You series can find two. it from there. Yep, yeah, the Spotlight 70 Series 2. Right, we don't have the box. Yeah, we don't have the box yet. It's it okay, though. So today. this stuff is incredible. I appreciate you. Oh, Thank here's you. a little sticker here. Yeah, so this is what the new one's going to look like, a That's green it. box. So uh, what else do you have? I know you got a couple oh, other pieces well, here. Well, yeah, you. these are just some experiments in card art. Elf. This is an Elf tobacco card. This is card. incredible. Hey, look, what I'm doing here, Spotlight 70 are paintings that were turned into cards. Yeah. What I also do... Oh, I made this. This is this was. I was so, very very proud to partner. So with so you. this is the official mint card yeah. that came out. This one is actually uh, this one's numbered to ninety nine. Yeah, they made all 99. of them are numbered, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I had a lot of fun to work with them on this on this project. I'm totally flattered and honored. I like it's off to, center. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> OC, OC. Yeah. Um, so what I've also brought here, besides the original paintings yep. used for the Spotlight Seventy set, are cards that won't be made. Uh, uh, into cards. These okay. are these are just explorations in 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 the concept of one of ones. Gotcha. Here, for example, is a one of one 1993 tops Kevin Mitchell. The Kevin the Mitchell. Mariners. Um, this is a Kehinde Wiley illustration that was published in New York Magazine when I was 28. It was one of my first uh, illustration assignments, but it happened to exist on a trading card. Uh, I, I I cut it down to yeah. fit to make it to drive a bunch of published illustrations that I turned into cards. Just kind of exploring the whole one of one. For idea. sure. Yeah. And this I just brought. This is a fun Spotlight 70 card. I brought three of them numbered autographed. Okay. But the reason I like this card, I feel, feel like PSA and, and all, all the grading companies need to know about this. Spotlight 70 was a tribute to many aspects of the whole tradition of collecting cards. This card happens to be a tribute to the hand cut box bottom. Therefore, it is intentionally miscut because who among us ever perfectly cut a box bottom? If it were to be graded, it might it would not get knocked receive down. a gem yeah. tet. Yeah. It might have an, an, an OC. Right. But this is a perfect example of embracing imperfection as sure. perfection. Yeah. Because this card, while off-centered, is technically perfect. And that is its own statement to me. And that's where I like the idea of the art card saying a whole separate thing also separate from anything that the subject shows how cool so this one's actually number two of three yes on I this one as three well autographed john crux tomorrow what we will have for sale will be the first and only complete each in a, a one touch with a magnetic seal complete autographed one of one spotlight 70 set wow it okay is, it's for sale in a in a padded box gotcha case you know. how cool how unique so that's coming so, tomorrow th then. this is what i like i still like the elf card yeah i mean again oh, i was an i was an that. 80s kid also um so yeah you may a, also enjoy then the shelly from cheers tobacco card that i okay. have at the table i gotcha. also have face from a team i okay. have mc hammer as a bat boy in the oakland days <laughs> awesome uh so there's a bunch more tobacco cards there very cool. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Well, thank you for coming on. Thanks Appreciate for having it, me. Andy. It's great talking so, with you. Thank and you. And that's it. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Mm -hmm.